Hello and welcome to Marikati Gaming. I've decided to kick off my new YouTube channel with an informative Let's Play of Victoria 2 with the historical flavor mod. Now, my goal in this series is to showcase Victoria 2's uniquely materialist approach to history, as well as show off some Ethiopian history and 19th century imperialist history in general. Now, we're going to be playing as Ethiopia, more specifically as Tigray, under Ras Wube Haile Mariam. Now, you might wonder why I've chosen Ethiopia specifically to showcase this game and not one of the more obvious choices like France or Prussia. Well, I believe that Ethiopia is actually an ideal way to examine all, or as close to all as possible, of Victoria II's mechanics, both the way that non-Western nations uh, play the way it handles the transition from a feudal agrarian economy to an industrial capitalist economy. Uh, also, the way that histori the historical flavor mod in particular handles the uh, c conquest of Africa. And as well as the way that Victoria II's primary and accepted, and accepted culture system works. Ethiopia has also always been of personal interest to me, both because of its historic central status as a bastion of resistance to imperialism, as well as the democratic history of the, of the Oromo people, but most of all, they've just always been my favorite nation to play as in pretty much every Paradox game. I like playing as the Kingdom of Axum as a challenge in Crusader Kings 2, since you're on the far south, south of the map, surrounded by enemies. Uh, in EU4, they're a stealth superpower that can very easily, although with some challenge, become one of the strongest countries in the game. In Victoria 2, they are interesting for all the reasons I've just described, and in Hearts of Iron 4, they're a fun way to beat your head against the wall for a few hours, I guess. But, above all else, I'm really a better writer than I am a talker, so if you want a full explanation of the reason I'm covering this game in particular, I would recommend you uh, click on the link to the blog post in the comment, or in the description. Now, those of you who came from that blog post might very well be asking, well, this all sounds really, really interesting, but what the hell am I looking at? Which is a fair question. If you've never played Victoria 2 before, it's kinda hard to get into, to say the least. Now, I won't be giving you a full instruction man manual in this first video, but those of you who already have played do know what Victoria 2 looks like. If you have played it or seen it played, you can pretty much skip past this one. I'm, I'll be leading folks through the basics in this one. So, we're going to have to begin where any good historical materialist begins with the means of production. There are basically three different ways in which goods get produced in Victoria 2. The first is through resource gathering operations, or RGOs. These occur with one good in each province you control. As you can see, this, this one produces cattle, this one produces fruit, and basically the the more industrial tech you have, and also, but more importantly, the more laborers and farmers you have, the more of a good in each province you will produce. So that is how you produce extractive goods like food or timber. The second way in which goods are, are produced and brought to the market in Victoria 2 is through factories. We are not an industrial capitalist country or socialist country, so we have no factories. I'll explain the factory system once we uh, have some, but basically, yeah, that's, that's the big one that we're going to be looking for. The third and final way is through artisans. Artisans are your middle-class pops who live in your various cities and towns. Your butchers, your bakers, your candlestick makers. They take goods uh, that are harvested by your farmers and laborers, and they turn them at a slower rate into finished products. 
Now, basically, unless you're China making certain luxury goods, it's not really a viable way to really get your produce produce on the world market. So don't expect to be a leader in anything if most of your m most of the way you make stuff that doesn't grow out of the ground is through artisans. So, having gotten production out of the way, here is our budget tab, and oh boy. Yeah, you can see those line graphs and pie charts. Um, get used to those. There's, there's, uh, y you're gonna have to keep an eye on quite a few of those in Victoria too. Uh, we'll start with our taxes, that being the most straightforward of the parts of the budget slider. As you can imagine, the higher you slide it, the more tax you collect. But the percentage you actually see is not the percentage you actually collect. It all depends on your tax efficiency, which for us is less than half. So we aren't actually going to be taking everything that our people make, whether they are lower, middle, or upper class. Um, we're going to have to get most of it from the lower class because our middle and upper classes are so small. But it's where we are asking our tax collectors to take as much as they possibly can because we need all the money we can get. Now, this pie chart determines, uh, displays how many of your pops or citizens in each strata are getting their needs met. So every, every group of citizens, every pop group, um, has a series of, uh, of goods that they need to buy in order to fulfill their life needs. That is to say, the things they need just to survive each day. Their everyday needs, so the, which sort of mark the difference between life and survival. And your luxury needs, which mark, mark the difference between life being life and life being good. So, basically, yeah, we are not doing so well on the meeting our pop's needs front, at least for now we're not, but we can't really help charging them taxes, because as you can imagine, as you can imagine, uh, the more tax you charge your pops, the less they have to spend on the goods they need to fulfill their needs. So that's why the need pie chart is next to the tax slider, because the two are indirectly related. And, uh, Next, you have your uh, precious goods, which uh, basically determines which is bas basically determines how much gold you're mining. Gold, as opposed to other goods, rather than being sold on the market, is is converted directly into currency. Uh, this game basically runs on a gold standard. Um, once you've modernized, you can have a national bank. Uh, we don't really have one to speak of, um, but it's your your pops do put money into it, so it, it has a fund based on that. In the meantime, to go with our other taxes, we have a tariff slider. Now, you would think that a tariff slider would be useful for protectionist purposes if you have a nation that's just starting to industrialize, but this isn't really the case in Victoria 2 because there's kind of a weird quirk to how trade works. Your citizens, your pops, will always buy from their own common market first, no matter what. And, you know, there's really no reason for them not to because uh, Victoria 2 doesn't have dynamic pricing. All goods have, like, a single price worldwide because the economy uh, is already complex enough without having to introduce that into the equation. So, yeah... Tariffs aren't really that useful for that. Um, so as your nation does, like a, a, as you're you're able to generate more money, you kind of want to wean yourself off tariffs because all you're doing is just making stuff more expensive for your people. But again, they're useful. It's useful for raising money, and we need all we can get. So yeah, 75, 76 sounds about good. And in the budget tab itself, industrial t subsidies, those are at zero for obvious reasons. Uh, next you have your army, navy, and construction subsidies. These represent uh, buying supplies for your military. So your army, 
your army slider will determine your organization rate for your troops uh, as well as how quickly they're able to replenish the supplies they need uh, your navy slider determines that but for your sh your navy obviously and the construction tab uh, determines how much you spend on the goods you need to build things like railroads forts and factories now your education slider determines how much your intellectuals or clerics or, or uh, clerics in the uh, base game get paid the more they get paid the more of your population will want to convert to intellectuals and also the faster they will educate them the fa the faster your literacy rate will increase and the faster your research points will increase we're going to need to fund the hell out of our education because our literacy rate is at one percent and our research points are at one per day neither of those are are, are very good but i mean there are some nations we're not that far behind. Russia's is only 8%. And at least we have a written language. In the Historical Project mod and all derived mods, including the Historical Flavor mod, uh, nations which historically did not have a written language system at this point in history have to develop one before they can do anything else technologically. So that's one handicap we don't have. The administration tab does the same thing as the education tab, except for your bureaucrats. Uh, what bureaucrats do is they in increase your administrative efficiency, which is a number that's determined by the number of accepted culture bureaucrats in your country, which you'll figure out more about what that means when we get to the population tab. I won't bore you too much with the details, but long story short, admin efficiency is important if you want to be able to effectively maintain your army, infrastructure, or factories. Um, another thing that increasing your administration spending does is it increases your ability to fight crime. And that allows you to take away certain provincial debuffs, which affect your production negatively. For example, here we, is, here we have several houses of ill repute in Asmara, which apparently is causing our workers to not work so hard. I don't know. But... Your crime-fighting ability will take away some of those malices. Social spending? We don't have any social reforms, so we're not spending anything on social spending, but that's what that tab controls. And uh, military spending determines how much your soldiers get paid. And the more your soldiers get paid, the more of your people will become soldiers. So basically the same thing as education and administration. Now looking at technology... We won't be looking at this tab too much for the first few decades because, as an unindustrialized country, we can't actually research anything. But it's less of a tech tree and more of a tech drop down menu, which actually gives you a few more options than most games with a tech tree do. But where our research points go instead is into our modernization reforms. Now, the modernization reforms are basically are basically like those old math problems you got as a kid, where you had to try and make exact change using, like, three quarters and two dimes and four pennies. Um, or, you, you know, whatever mixture of however many coins you had. You're looking at to see how to spend your research points most efficiently and effectively. Like, for instance... This tends to be one of the more efficient reforms. Reformed education system, you get 15% progress uh, for a cost of uh, about 14,500. Now, the cost can vary depending on your, your the politics of your uh, upper house or of your people in general. Like, if I believe if conservative is higher, military reforms are cheaper. And if liberal is higher, education reforms are cheaper. And if reactionary is higher, all reforms are more expensive. And uh, with every reform you spent, you you pass, um, the reactionary elements in your in your society, in your country, grow more militant and more likely to rebel against you as you overturn your country's traditional ways. Now, there are two exceptions in, particularly in the historical flavor mod, to this you know 
this basic addition game. Uh, one of them is uh, some of the military reforms in HFM, such as uh, foreign trading methods, allow you to gain big chunks of research points by conquering other countries. So that can be very useful in terms of making your, uh, in terms of accelerating the process through militarization. You know, it makes a bit of intuitive sense. Your military is creates a certain demand for these industrial modern goods. Uh, and the other one, and this one is particular to historical flavor mod, I don't think it even exists in the base game, is foreign universities. It And what it does is it doubles your research point rate. So we're going to be going for those once we have enough points. We don't have anywhere close right now. And that brings us to the real... The, the real meat of the politics tab, which is the uh, w which is your ruling party. Now, every ruling party has its own set of ideologies that determine what your government can and cannot do. Um, right now, because we're an absolute monarchy, we choose our ruling party. We're going with the faction of the Ross of Tigray, which is conservative. And we're probably going to be sticking with that for quite a while, because... They have some economic the uh, they have some economic policies which are very useful for a nation that's just starting out. They have uh, protectionism, which lets you set your tariffs high, which again that's not that useful for protecting your industry, but for raising money it's quite useful. Um, and also state capitalism, which lets you build factories with state money. Now this is incredibly useful starting out because when you first westernize and modernize, you don't really have many or any capitalists at all to finance the building of your factories. So you're going to have to want to do that yourself. And more to the point, even if you did, the I'll put this delicately, as delicately as I can possibly put it, um, in terms of choosing which factories to build, the capitalists in this game fucking suck ass. That's about as gently as I can put it. And, I mean, it's a, I understand it's kind of complex to model a whole economy, but the, the factories they choose to finance the building of tend to have little to do with what, re, what resources are in the provinces, what, what, what can be built effectively. Uh, I mean, it can be helpful to switch to laissez-faire once you've built yourself. The, import, the important factories that you want and need are, are going to be profitable because this, in turn, decreases the cost of upgrading those factories. But Victoria 2 is a game where central planning tends to be more effective because it's done by a human and not by an AI which is optimized to run on a 2010 quality computer in a very simplified and abstracted model of the economy. So, yeah, state capitalism is where, where you want to start out with, and then perhaps move on to a planned economy. Now, right now, we can only choose between conservative, liberal, and reactionary. Um, fairly soon, within the next 10 years, socialists are going to start to, start to appeal, appear, and these, uh, these basically represent social democrats. And then a bit after that, you'll start to see communists. Um, and the extent to which we see those in our, in our country, we're going to see that in our movements tab. Now, the movements tab can determine, or the movements tab shows you the demand for various reforms in your country, as well as, as well as the risk that various nationalist or political movements uh, will rise against you if their militancy is high enough. Now, then there's the decision tab, and uh, the decision tab is basically it's certain special things we can do if certain conditions can met are met. Uh, we don't have any decisions we can make right now, so yeah, we'll move on and get to that uh, get to that bridge when we reach the river. And that'll bring us to the population tab. And this right here 
is really where the game happens. Now, pops are units of population, which can vary in size from just like a small handful, like 75 or even like 6 or 7, to hundreds of thousands or even millions. They represent your ever-changing and dynamic populace. But before we even get to what's in this screen specifically, let's discuss the numbers we see here on top. Now, right next to there, right next to the flames, you can see our militancy number, and that represents a pops, or in the case of this top screen number, all of our pops combined uh, desire for either a specific reform to be passed or to revolt against you. The higher this number is, the greater the likelihood that a particularly popular reform will pass the upper house or that a particularly unpopular government will face rebellions. Militancy is affected by a number of factors, but quite possibly the biggest one is whether or not a pop's life or everyday needs are being met. It makes sense. Uh, if someone doesn't have any food, they tend to be upset about that. <clears throat> Other, contri uh, other contributors include uh, being an unaccepted cultural mi minority, an unpopular party holding power, or a long, costly war that you are losing. And this, this is, this is where the Marxist ma magic happens. This is your consciousness button. And consciousness is is meant in the Marxist sense. It represents your pop's political awareness, its tendency and willingness to act collectively in accordance with their desires as a group. Now, this can represent a class consciousness or a national consciousness or or, or even simply an, ideal, an ideological consciousness like uh, uh, support for universal suffrage or, or women's suffrage. It is... It's something that increases with your with your population's literacy, as well as its access to luxury goods, among other things. And it tends to decrease when your government passes reforms that the pop in question wants. Uh, it gives them the sense that oh, we have some we have we have a government up top that is working on our behalf. Maybe we don't need so much to work as a group. At least that's the logic behind the actual game mechanic. Now each pop always maintains the same culture and and occupation. It that always remains the same. And once it's locked in place that it stays there. It's the dynamism is reflected in the ways that its size changes. It can increase or decrease with births or deaths, or increase while another one decreases as people switch from one pop to another, either by changing jobs or assimilating culturally or migrating to another province or another country altogether. Now, I promised Marxism, so let's talk about classes. Uh, I'm going to start with the backbone of, of Ethiopia right now, our farmers and laborers. Now, farmers and laborers are, are basically the same, so I'm grouping them together. They work on your research, resource gathering operations, your RGOs, for the landowners who live in the same province. They, the farmers and laborers keep a small portion of the income that the RGO generates, while the rest of it, the majority of it, goes to the landlord. Now, these are one day going to be the foundation of our proletarian class as we industrialize and they are moved into the roles of urban classmen craftsmen or wage feed or field laborers working for an hourly wage but in any case the landowners here represent ethiopia's feudal aristocracy and indeed in the base game they are called aristocrats which is why they're listed first in al the alphabetical order now i discussed artisans earlier. Artisans are, again, your burgers. They make finished goods at a fairly low, inefficient rate. These guys are making furniture. These guys are making fabric. Uh, they're getting input from other places. Bureaucrats represent the administrators and law enforcers, 
enforcement, and as I said in our budget tab, they increase your country's admin efficiency and crime fighting. This is going to be probably one of the two landing places for our new middle class pops as our literacy rises. This, along with the intellectual, are basically form the core of the bourgeoisie that we are basically building from scratch here. Capitalists own and operate, own and invest in our railroads, factories, and to a lesser extent, our national bank. They keep the lion's share of the profits of the factories that our craftsmen and clerks work at. Now, again, we are not an industrial capitalist country, so we don't have any of those. But they are marginally more useful than the aristocrat because in addition to, to extracting the surplus value from the craftsmen and clerks, they also invest into new railroads, new factories, and uh, all sorts of nice new stuff that uh, you don't have to pay for with your own treasury. So I guess they've got that going for them. Uh, and next, uh, we have our intellectuals. Uh, they're called clergy in the base game. Again, they contribute to your country's research points and increase your literacy rate. Craftsmen and clerks, we've already mentioned. Craftsmen and clerks represent the uh, low-skilled and skilled workers in factories, respectively. Uh, craftsmen increase the throughput, that is to say, the, in, the number of goods that are required required as input and the number of goods that come out as output, while clerks increase efficiency. Soldiers and <clears throat> officers, those are fairly self-explanatory. Soldiers determine how big your army can be, and officers determine how many leaders you can generate. Now, the <clears throat> HPM and all derived mods, including HFM, introduce a surf system. Um, we don't have any serfs, and we're never going to, so I'm not going to talk about them. And last, and unfortunately least, we have slaves. Slaves are exactly what they sound like. They have no life needs to be met because they are... They are paid, quote-unquote, by being fed. And, but other than... Other than this, uh, their other than this, their various needs will never be met because they have no money. So their everyday and luxury needs, those are never going to be met. So that means their militancy will increase as time passes. Uh, so as the decades go on, it won't take much to trigger trigger a slave revolt. And unlike other pops, they can't convert to other types. They are stuck as slaves. Having large pops with no money to spend is bad if you have an industrial economy, so there are also practical as well as moral reasons to abolish slavery in this game. So, in addition to class, we also have culture and nationality to, work about, to worry about. Every nation has a primary and most, and many of them have at least one accepted culture within their country. For ours, the primary culture is obviously Tigrayan, and whereas uh, Amhara, Cushitic, and various Nilotic groups, uh, the latter two are kind of broad grab bag, cultural grab bag categories, um, are, those are also accepted cultures. Membership in primary and accepted cultures affects a great number of things, least among them their support for particular citizenship laws, such as residency, limited citizenship, or full citizenship. Uh, pops outside of the primary or accepted cultures who live in provinces where the primary or accepted cultures are present, they can also assimilate into those cultures. It tends to happen at a very, very slow rate, though, unless you are in the Americas or Oceania. Uh, the rate at which they do or don't is determined by a number of factors, like literacy, mi militancy, and unemployment rate. But the biggest one is, uh, are you American or Australian? In which case, it will happen quickly. Otherwise, it will tend to happen quite slowly. Uh, next, we have uh, religion, which is 
you know, it's less important than it is in other games, to the extent that it's kind of too boring to talk about what it affects, so I won't. And here in the pop screen, we are going to make our first decision of this game. Because in the pop screen, you can select your national focuses. Every country gets at least one, and each national focus lets you do something, usually to the pops of a particular province. Now, our primary focus is going to be increasing our literacy rate. So, we are going to ship all of the Rick and Morty DVD cases we have to Tigray to try and boost our intellectual population. <laughs> but yes, that is the decision we've made. We are we need to boost our intellectual population up to at least 2% in our country. So that's going to be what we are doing with our national focus basically for the next several decades. Now, trade, I think we've discussed production enough that we don't have to discuss trade much, but we can see here what our in incoming and outgoing goods are. Which brings us to the Diplomacy screen. This is where, as you would imagine, you do all your diplomatic, dip, diplomatic things. You can slowly build up your diplomatic points over time to be able to do things like justify a war or declare war, uh, make other countries like you more or less. Right now, the Ottoman Empire doesn't feel about us one way or the other. And um, it also shows you the status of other countries, most importantly, the great powers. Now, right here are the great powers. There's eight of them, presumably because that's how many signatories there were to the Boxer Protocols in the early 20th century. Now, nations in Victoria II are classified either as great powers. Uh, secondary powers, which is the next eight countries after the great powers, uh, civilized nations, any nation that is westernized and can build, build factories but isn't a great or secondary power, and uh, uncivilized nations, which is everyone else. Your rank among the world's powers are de is determined by your score, which is uh, a combination of your prestige, your industrial power, and your military power. Uh, the leader right now is the United Kingdom with a score of 285. We are ranked uh, 128th with a score of 2. So we've got a ways to go if we want to join the great powers, but I can tell you, it can be done and I aim to do it. I also aim, I also aim to help dismantle at least one of these big European empires who are going to be fucking around my continent over the next few decades. I won't specify which specific one I have in mind, but... I might give you a few hints, drop a few here and there. In any case, the great powers can do a whole lot of things that other countries can't. The most important one, though, is that they can add other countries to their economic sphere of influence. Now, what this does is it gives you access to a portion of another nation's goods in your own common market, as if it were part of the mar common market of your own country. You get them for free, they can't charge tariffs on them. Being in a sphere of influence with another country can be good or bad depending on the circumstances, regardless of whether you're the sphere leader or one of the countries being sphered. I have found that if you're the country being sphered, it tends to swamp your country with goods and crowd your factories out of the market. So. We'll be trying to avoid that to the extent that we can, with one exception, which I'll get to when it happens. Great powers also receive priority for goods on the world market, so even outside of their sphere. Um, pops will sell to great powers before they sell to anybody else. Now, secondary powers can't do any of that, but they can colonized during the scramble for Africa, so they've got that going for them. The most notable aspect about war in Victoria 2, which, you know, that's probably the most important thing you'll be doing in this diplomacy screen, is that you can't declare it unless you already have a reason to do so. If you don't have one, you need to fabricate one 
which will give you something you can demand at the peace table. For example, if I wanted to go to go to war with the Ottoman Empire right now. I don't. They're much stronger than me. But if I did, um, I could fabricate a place in the sun, cast his belly, and risk the and uh, risk being detected. And if I am detected, it generates a certain amount of infamy depending on when I am detected. Now, infamy is basically a measure of how bad of a boy that the world thinks you're being. Basically, anything above 25, and the world and the various nations of the world will form a coalition against you unless you've become so powerful that it's pointless to try to attack you, or if you're so remote that no one really gives a shit except your neighbors. So, I've I don't expect either of those things to happen. I d but hey, it could. In any case. We want to keep our infamy below 25. Which is a problem because we need to fabricate some Cassus Bellies. We have claims already on the ver on various parts of Eritrea, as well as on the capital city of Gondor itself. But neither of those are really where we want to attack right now. See, Ethiopia right now is disunified. In 1836, Ethiopia was going through what is historia historiographically called the Era of the Princes, in which it was in which control was divided amongst a series of re uh, amongst a group of regional nobles and warlords, and the emperor in Gondor ruled in name only. There's a puppet emperor right now, but the guy who's really in charge is this fellow, Ross Ali II of the Yeju Oromo. Other members of the Ethiopian nobility, though, had higher ambitions than this. The most notable was one Kasa Hailu, who eventually rose from his humble origins to become Emperor Tuadros II. But another, another person who aimed to become emperor was... Ras Wube Haile Mariam of Tigray. In fact, he probably came closer than anyone other than Tuadros II to becoming emperor. He just got really absurdly unlucky in a way I'm going to tell you about next video. Now, in real life, what he did was he extended his control over the north, imported some firearms, and attacked Gondor and nearly won. We're not going to be doing that. We're going to be fabricating a CB against the kingdom of Shua. Shua is probably stealthily the most powerful of these kingdoms, but right now they're weaker than they're ever going to be. So we're going to accept the alliance offer from the kingdom of Kaffa and try and attack Shua with them. We're going to need to get lucky with the fabrication of our Castus Belly, though, because if we get caught, it could generate 22 infamy. So, tune in next time for when we begin the reunification of Ethiopia. This is totally not a video break that will allow me to save scum. No, sir. See you next time.